Welcome to the Busted Fighters Repaired Daily Podcast. On Busted Fighters, we discuss sports medicine topics important to MMA athletes, their doctors, therapists, trainers, and coaches. Our guests tell their story of recovery from a specific injury, what worked for them, what didn't, and why. I'm your host, Matt Colby. I'm a chiropractic sports physician, and I focus on the problems MMA athletes run into during training, fight camps, and competition. Today, I'm here with my friends Tom Allman, Matt Andrade, and today's guest, Kyler Phillips. Kyler is currently 7-1 and one in the UFC. He's known for having a diverse skill set, and he's also known for the unique way he moves his body. Kyler just moves differently than most of the rest of us, and that's why we call him the Matrix. Today, we went into some depth regarding Kyler's athletic history. He grew up surfing, doing parkour, climbing, and a little bit of gymnastics, and we talked about how that relates to his movement. He even went into how playing the piano and other forms of music and art influence the way he moves and his unique fighting style. Oh, we also discussed uh, what you should know about playing inverted guard and its relationship to cervical disc problems. We talked about different forms of traction as treatment for cervical disc problems. Uh, we talked about the UFC PI and what we can learn from the data that they have compiled and shared. Uh, we talked about how your sports rehab can and should be a learning experience. So we had a really good time, and I hope you enjoy it. So without further delay, here we are with Kyler, the Matrix Phillips. All right, so Kyler, you were talking about a big toe injury and a, a broken big toe and how that was worse than breaking your arm even. Yeah, man, it's just uh, still, that was like, what, 12 years ago? And it's still like my, yeah, my toe nail literally grows in and it's like there's like lines in it mm -hmm. it's like deformed yeah when you bust a toe really good and damage the nail it'll, it'll often stay that way forever and a lot of fighters actually get concerned because they think they get, got fungus you know uh, and you go to the podiatrist and they're like no you just broke this thing forever it's just going to grow funny but the, the important thing about breaking a big toe is this because it happens a lot to wrestlers and it'll it'll take them out for a season because when uh, you break your big toe, you have two joints in your body that are very prone to what's called adhesive capsulitis. That's your shoulder, your GH joint, your shoulder, and the great toe. And the thing is, when you hurt, you, you don't even have to break it, but when you hurt that joint, it's prone to scar tissue. So it'll scar up and then your toe won't go extend and flex as, as much as it should, which of course limits you when you go in to shoot for a single or a double or anything like that. So, or lunging and things like that. So it can mess you up for a year, but in wrestling and MMA, more than anything, it can. I've done that too. Uh, in jujitsu, I've probably hurt my feet more than anything. And I've broke both my big toes and one of them I broke twice. And it can slow you down a ton. What kind of stuff did you do for it? Did you actually try to pry it back and forth? Uh, nothing, I was actually young. I was like, yeah. I was a little kid. But I just had, uh, what's it called? Uh, what's these called? <laughs> So oh, the walkers? <laughs> no, the, uh, you know, the, st the stupid things. That, uh, you know what I'm talking about? Crutches. Yeah, crutches. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I had some crutches, man. Good. It's crazy how the littlest thing make the biggest difference. Yeah. And you, you have, like, a bigger injury, and you, like, it's, you just see it there, and it's, like, you're taking more care of it. But little things, like, you don't take as much as care, mm -hmm. let's say. So did you do any gymnastics as a kid? Uh, I, I got in parkour. I thought gymnastics. I used to go to like open gym on Wednesdays. They mm -hmm. had like an open gym gymnastics place, and they'd have a uh, it's like a open gym for like an hour and a half, and you pay like five bucks. So I'd go with all my break dancing friends, a couple <laughs> other parkour kids, mm -hmm. and we'd go. And they, some the breaking kids would go, and some gymnastic kids, and we'd just line up a bunch of stuff. We would just put a wall mat on, go run up the wall, see how many steps you can run, uh, do a backflip. We just like make little courses and just try to do crazy stuff, corkscrews and front flips and stuff. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that stuff was fun to me a lot. You know, I was into more like power moves and doing a lot of crazy flips instead of just the little mm -hmm. tricky dance stuff. So I think I geared more towards power stuff. And um, that's when I started getting into like more dangerous things, doing mm -hmm. things outside, jumping <laughs> off of like, jumping off, like climbing up stuff and flipping off of things onto the floor, or, you know wall spins and stuff so mm. that was fun and i still like doing that stuff but i just have to be careful now because if i do get injured it's like 
Yeah. It goes against my job. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it seems like some of the things you did when you were very young, you know, set you up for the sport you're involved in today. We do see a lot of that in with gymnasts, particularly people who grow up as gymnasts very often find themselves in other sports. And um, because when you think about it, training gymnastics, I mean, you're, you're training a complete athlete in that regard. <laughs> And uh, lots of times we see gymnasts become great wrestlers like Victoria Anthony. We see gymnasts become great fighters, of course, like GSP and, um, and uh, things like that. You were telling me that um, one of the worst injuries you've had, like, you know, in adult life is a neck injury. Was that during prepping for your last fight? Uh, yeah, it wasn't really, I don't want to say the worst, but it was the most annoying. Mm -hmm. And the most annoying thing is just like all the time. And I'd have to kind of gear myself and, and really make my camp more geared towards recovering and getting a good train. So my last fight, I injured my neck early on in camp and I just had to really treat it like a baby. And I was working over with um, Al at Ares Physical Therapy. Mm -hmm. He was helping me out and I was doing a lot of uh, just deep massaging and stuff. And it was actually like, it felt like on the side, but he was going through the front a lot, mm -hmm. which helped. And um, yeah, just literally doing the right things and being more smart on being there in time and always warming up the correct way and always cooling down after is uh, really important for me now because that's exactly why I'd get some injuries sometimes mm -hmm. is just jumping into practice and going straight into live or going straight into sparring without warming up properly. Of course, warming up, but not doing the, the correct exercises that's geared for your whole body, mm -hmm. you know, so. Gotcha. Uh, A lot of people from the lab treat over at, at ARS, I think. Um, they're very close together. One thing we talk about on the podcast a lot is Phoenix as an MMA city. Like the, there's there's tons of MMA here in Phoenix, and as a result, there's a bunch of there's a lot of different doctors and therapists that te uh, treat MMA athletes. Um, what what kind of other stuff uh, did they do with your neck? Did they do any traction when you when you did that? Like decompression or traction or anything like that? Uh, I think I got needling mm -hmm. and then stuff like that. And then when I went over right before my fight. I went all the way, it was uh, Heather from the Performance Institute. Yeah. She's uh, she's badass, man. Mm -hmm. She's uh, super high level, actually probably the highest level I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. And um, she, was she was training the uh, for the Olympics, all the Olympic guys and stuff in Colorado. And she, I did a session with her and we did so much different stuff in one session. Like I literally got needling, I got like CBD therapy, massage, deep, deep tissue massage, cupping therapy. I got the um, the shock therapy, and then uh, just a bunch of stuff we did all in like one session. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, she was teaching me a lot of things, and I felt like I was learning a lot. I felt like I was actually taking a class, mm -hmm. getting a uh, session with her. Yeah, it, it's very much a learning environment over there. You yeah. often see interns there for the day or the week or so. Um, I got to follow, it's uh, Heather Linden, who, who runs the whole whole show up there. Uh, as far as sports medicine goes, I got to follow them around for a few days, and uh, it was it was a great environment. And uh, one of the things too is I believe she worked over at the Olympic Training Center for I believe it was like ten years, and um, you know then then went to the UFC PI, and we talk about the UFC PI a lot on the podcast too. And one thing that I've noticed in a course I took this year, and after visiting the PI, is that um, it does seem at least I'm not entirely sure, but it seems like they do model a lot of their treatment methodology there after the Olympic Training Center, which is which is obviously great because because um, everything's very thorough. You know? Yeah, um, that's perfect. Yeah, man. I well, went to the no, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I went to the performances too. Last time I was in Vegas and they just yeah, it's like just a yeah. whole nother level it, of it's a fun place of recovery and stuff in yeah. my rib too. I had a, a little rib injury from when I was a kid. Even when I try to surf, it's annoying because my rib is popped out. Every time I try to surf, it's better to use a, one of those foam boards because mm -hmm. it like hurts to just mm -hmm. chill on the board. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, they said you can fix that. A lot of doctors my whole life have been just telling me, no, you can't fix that, there's nothing you can do. Mm -hmm. And they can chisel that down, use this tool and really work on it. And um, also too, I, I hurt my clavicle mm -hmm. in my last camp and they were working under they were using that tool, and they're actually not just going at the surface, but getting like under through the back. Probably and it like hurt a, a Graston tool, like a metal tool. Yeah, yeah. 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 So yeah, there's a lot of ways to treat myofascial, where, where you go from 
you know, massage therapy and Graston and ART and ASTEM and all these techniques, all myofascial techniques. And what you usually find is the technique doesn't matter, it's who's doing it. Have they been doing it a long time? Are they really good at it and stuff? And when it comes to rib injuries, um, wrestlers get rib injuries a lot. And uh, I, I, I uh, had a rib injury in the first jiu-jitsu tournament I ever did. And you can, you can sublux, you know, you can, you can uh, pop a rib out pretty easily. Mm-hmm. You can also tear your uh, cartilage in between your ribs pretty easily. And the challenge there is that when you heal from a rib injury, just like anything else when you're, when you're healing, uh, everything tightens up. So you tighten up and you heal, but then maybe you don't get all your range of motion back again. You know, when you're looking at somebody's shoulder and they've healed up and you're trying to get their range of motion back, it's pretty easy to tell if they've got it or not. With a rib injury, what we're dealing with is the range of motion of your ribs that move like a bucket handle, you know, as you breathe 24 seven. And it's hard to assess if a rib's really moving right or not. Usually it's the patient, the athlete who can tell like, this thing still feels a stitch tight, you know? Mm. And if it's still a stitch tight, you're not completely healed from it. It affects your breathing, it affects your diaphragm. And other than getting in there with with myofascial tools, um, you have to do a lot of breathing exercises, which really aggressive athletes don't really like to do. You know, it's like taking a a really aggressive athlete and sending them to a yoga class. They're like, I'm bored here. Uh, but if you really work on diaphragmatic breathing and things to strengthen your intercostal muscles mm-hmm. and um, get your range of motion back, you can get there. Even though you had that injury years ago, here they are working on it years later to make it better. So is that different from like a broken rib as well? Yeah, it's like more more of a concern rather than, than like a fracture to a rib is the soft tissue, everything in between each rib and getting that to move right again because it's hard to get in there. So it's easy to see how you could get it 90% better and just live with it. But you know you're not you're not at your maximum. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting because like the breathing exercise, yeah, it's like the more you know, as far as like exercising and range mm-hmm. of motion, the less injury you mm-hmm. will have. And that's what I'm just trying to do is like learn more about. And that's why when I go there, hanging out mm-hmm. with whoever and learning about more, m- moving my body in different ways, and not just for for the sake of like injuries, but for the sake of range of motion. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's really important. And if you don't get it back, you can develop this horrendous condition called slipping rib syndrome where oh. everything's a stitch too tight so you pop it out again uh, or strain yeah. it again or sprain it again and then you do it again by the time you do this set two or three times that that thing's loose forever and there yeah. are there are athletes too that when they try to say bench press or even push up or anytime they really engage their core it clicks so throughout a workout they feel fine until 45 minutes in and then their ribs all flared up again and no matter what they do um 45 minutes into anything uh flared up rib and it can be super frustrating so it just shows us it's one of those things that you know your first chance to fix it is your best chance and you really want to be uh determined to fix it 100 percent when you have the chance and a lot of doctors and therapists will tell you well that that's as good as it's going to get and there time and time again we see athletes who just insisted on continuing to work on it continuing to work on it until they get 100 percent better and usually get there it's I say it's tough too when you have injury or rib injury because you'll go jujitsu, mm-hmm. you get in these twisted positions, wrestling mm-hmm. practice, and then the next day you got kickboxing sparring. Somebody throws a kick or a knee or spin a kick to your rib, mm-hmm. and it's like you gotta just yeah. be super on point with that. Yeah, I keep thinking of Steve Young when he had those three broken ribs that he played with for half a season. Right. Right. <laughs> Damn. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and we were talking a little bit about neck injuries, especially in jujitsu and wrestling. Um, Some of the mechanisms of injury we think of, uh, neck injuries, not just acute neck injuries, but chronic ones like in wrestlers is of course, going in and getting stuffed in wrestling or in jujitsu if you play a lot of inverted guard, right? Which I don't really like to do a lot of. It's usually the smaller athletes that that do that a lot. And if you're playing a lot of inverted guard, the current theory on that is that you're stretching out the posterior longitudinal ligament that holds your discs in, in your cervical spine. And you're stretching that out and stretching that out, and then months later, whether you got actually, you know, injured in an acute situation or not, you can get bulging and herniated or sequestered discs in your neck. Yeah. Lots of times, when someone gets stacked really hard, they'll feel their neck go. They feel something let loose in their neck. They don't have a lot of pain or anything like that. But lo and behold, two weeks or two months later, they start developing the symptoms of a, of a disc injury. Yeah, so. I know a lot of jujitsu fighters that have uh, just from doing tri- like skinny dudes. Mm-hmm that have just been doing triangles over the years. A lot of people in California, too, that I know, just getting stacked, especially, I say if you, like, invert, because I like to invert a lot, and I like a lot of triangles, but 
if you go jiu-jitsu guy versus a good small jiu-jitsu guy both guys are kind of inverting and stuff it's not as bad but sometimes you go against a bigger guy or a big wrestler and you're trying to invert and you get him in a triangle or you're trying to bear him below it's somebody's trying to stack you or slam mm-hmm. you on your head that's there's a lot of injuries that mm-hmm. way and there are some some smaller guys that it seems like you could get stacked that way all day and for fine. years yeah. yeah yeah and then i know for me when when that happens to me it's like it's a matter of timing like you get stacked everything comes up this way you've got enough time to turn your head to one side or another and everything will be fine but let's say you don't let's say it's a tournament things are going harder and faster and you don't turn your head and you keep everything straight forward that's where these things do seem yeah. to blow out and a lot of competitors like years training mm-hmm. after time after mm-hmm. 20 a, years it's like your neck's gonna get messed it's up it's a chronic it's a chronic thing and what we see with a lot of like <coughs> career wrestlers that now do mma or jujitsu is their lower necks are already a bit torn up c5 six yeah. seven they have disc issues and one thing you hear about over and over again with disc issues is spinal decompression therapy or decompression therapy or they'll say cervical decompression therapy which is basically a fancy form of traction we have a traction machine and basically we do traction on the neck but with a certain protocol that's been proven to help a little bit better but here's the thing is decompression like say you got a bulging disc in your back bulging a herniated disc decompression therapy is fantastic and it works substantially better than traction necks though cervical spines necks have done great with regular traction for decades and that's why you see in wrestling you see a lot of people get those over the door traction units where the kind of you know bracket kind of goes over your door mm-hmm. and you sit there and you pull on a on a string or you put some weight on it and stuff okay. and those things work work really good and um you know so so with bulging discs in the back you kind of need the decompression table which is a big expensive piece of equipment and someone to do it with you the one that pulls you apart yeah pulls you apart like an accordion yeah, i was on that before yeah i loved it, it it's great i i really feel like um felt awesome if you have a bulging disc in your back that's that's your best chance it's at like fixing a torture it. yeah <laughs> yeah torture that's device. what i have yeah oh, that's what they said i have herniated yeah. disc at the bottom yeah so with lumbar you pretty much need that yeah. and but next do good sometimes with just regular old traction there's a lot of different home versions you can get um, there's some with like an elastic cord that um, you can tie to your doorknob and lay on the floor and do. I've actually got a bunch of them at the clinic and I'll give them to wrestlers all the time. Like we might do decompression therapy with their neck, assuming that's better. And then I'll, tr- I'll have them try the home unit. And if the home unit's good, send them home with one of those. They're only 30, 40 bucks hmm. and you can do it every day, you know? So 10 minutes a it's day. It's like a harness? Yeah. In your neck? Okay. Yeah, like your head goes in a harness, tied to the doorknob, it's got a bungee cord. Um, there's different types of harnesses that work better for different oh, okay. people. But um, you send a wrestler home with that and give them that, that they can do 10 minutes a day. Say it's a wrestler in their early 20s that's got, you know, some disc issues but not really bad. I mean, it really could prevent them from having a lot of trouble later on. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Have you messed around with the iron neck at all? No, I want to try it out, man. Yeah. Shoot. Those are expensive, though, huh? They, yeah, they're okay. fairly expensive. The downside is there's three different sizes, right? And there's two or three different versions, and you basically need the more expensive version to to, to do a great job with it. And um, if you get the medium size one, it fits most people, but um, you, you know probably 80% of the people that come in. What's great about it though is that you can get a really well-rounded neck workout without having to do, lots of times when you're doing neck exercises, you see in jiu-jitsu gyms a lot, rubber bands, right? Yeah. So you set up a rubber band, you figure out you know, the, the right strength and, and for the neck exercise, and then you have to set up another exercise, another exercise. If you get the iron neck to fit right on your head, it's kind of contraption-y, but once you get it fit on right, you can go right from one exercise to the other, and you can do a really decent neck workout in eight minutes. Mm. Um, for a wrestler, maybe 10, 12 minutes. For a new person who's never really worked out their neck and might get really sore, um, a lot of people recommend you just go four minutes, five minutes the first day because you might get a lot more sore than, than you're thinking. So. Yeah, I, used, I just use the basic jiu-jitsu neck warm-ups, like mm-hmm. side to side, up, down, mm-hmm. here to shoulder. And then my old, uh, but like way back in the day, I was doing some other stuff too with like, uh, what is that, the Bosu ball mm-hmm. or with uh, just yeah. a towel. Isometrics yeah. are a great, great way, way to start. And that's when, you know, you're just pushing into something, whether it's just your hands like this on the side of your head or a ball against the wall or something like that where you're not really moving, you're just pushing against. And, and that's a great way to start. 
just wanted to get a jack neck. Yeah. I'd <laughs> like a football player. Just I'd like I'd you like don't, don't want a neck. You don't noodle want body, a neck. Noodle body, neck. big neck. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Sure. I fucked my neck up brushing my teeth one time. We won't talk really? about that. Yeah. What? I was like sitting there brushing my teeth and I was talking to my wife and I had leg up and like it just tightened up. And it was from something else, but it like it, something triggered it. And then for like two weeks, my neck was jacked. <laughs> yeah. And like you were saying, it's a, it's a little it's annoying as shit. Yeah. Granted, not as glamorous as actually fighting. A lot of people will blow their <laughs> neck out yeah. just sneezing or they'll do it in the morning. Like people talk about uh, hurting their neck in the shower all the time in the morning because you wake up, your neck's stiff and sore, maybe just from living in general or something particular, and then you turn your head funny, you haven't really warmed up your neck for the day, and uh, you can do it that way. Women do it a lot, you blow drying their hair. They wake up in the morning, turn their head sideways to blow dry their hair and blow their neck out. I know one guy who claims he hurt his neck, he hurt his neck stirring a jar of organic peanut butter. So. I would just say peanut butter. Right. You know, it's all stiffer, you know what I mean? So, cool. Uh, let's see. Had to be chunky. Yeah. yeah. If it's creamy, then I don't know, man. Tastes good though. Yeah. Dogs like it. <laughs> I mean, what? <laughs> <laughs> so, Kyler, uh, Kyler, what do you do for day to day recovery? Of course, we've been talking a little bit about injuries, big injuries, and how you rehabbed them. But what about just the the day to day wear and tear from training? And how many days a week do you train? Do you train every day? I train six days a week, yeah. and then I take Sunday off and just chill. Mm -hmm. um, just the basics, of course, sleep is most important. But I like to, s I got, I just moved, I got a jacuzzi. So sitting in there, just grabbing somebody to massage you too. Like, of course, you're not always going to get a massage, but uh, using the Compex massage gun, I've been using that. Mm -hmm. um, I have a little shock therapy thing. And pretty much just stretching too, like right after practice. It's like I've been doing a lot of stretching with some of my teammates, like literally right after practice when everything's still warm, kind of like hot yoga. Mm -hmm. Everything's warm is the best time to stretch, especially the psoas, the hips, mm -hmm. uh, shoulders too, shoulders, uh, the back, keeping the back nice and loose. Mm -hmm. Psoas and anterior chain is really tough to get into. And I got the so right. Yeah, yeah that yeah. thing's great too. I like yeah. that. Mm. You can I do something similar with a kettlebell. Like a lot of CrossFit people do it. You take like a... 25 pound kettlebell okay. and you got to be careful to make sure it doesn't tip over but you go handle up put a towel on it you can only do one side at a time uh, that works pretty good i like with the so right you you can just lay on it you know the regular way but you can also kind of wiggle back and forth and massage yeah. it in there and you can actually do that and also you can raise your you know raise your foot your face down so you raise your foot and do like leg uh like if you were on a machine doing leg curls, yeah, okay. do that motion and it'll kind of Go floss that anterior chain underneath okay. it and you can kind of... That thing's intense yeah. for me, man. Yeah. I'm not even going to lie. It, 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 Dude. We use it in the clinic a lot and it's yeah. also a great test, right? Because it's great for releasing a psoas, but sometimes it's hard to tell if someone has mm. a contracted psoas or not. You try to dig into it, it tickles too much, it's hard to get in there. It's like when someone yeah. gets in your armpit, it just doesn't feel right. I and had that before. I got a massage through my... It was my shoulder. Yeah was hurting, I had a shoulder impingement. Somebody went through my sh uh, armpit and like went deep, like really deep. And I thought it was weird, but yeah, yeah. I think like going in those weird spots helps. And yeah. I think, I don't know if it was my psoas, but my lower back, mm -hmm. it went through my stomach yeah. to massage and went really deep. And it felt kind of creepy, but it got in there. <laughs> and yeah, it fixed, no, it fixed the part. I, yeah. I have that too. Yeah, sometimes with muscle guarding too, is the challenge is getting in there. Like for me, when someone tries to get in into my subscap in my armpit, or uh, my psoas is just, it's, it's too tickly. So when, <laughs> when I do it with the, but that's why that so right is great. It's like when, yeah. for some reason, when you do it, uh, you it control. doesn't feel that weird, you know? Right. And I've had a, I had a massage therapist once tell me, she's like, well, she's trying to dig into my psoas. She's like, well, put your hand on my hand and it won't do that. And it didn't, but then it's wow. like you're holding hands with the massage therapist oh. and it feels even stranger. Mm. So <laughs> I really like, I really like that's, that so right. Yeah, that's a good thing. You can do subscap with it too, which is kind of nice. Massage so therapist is a guy. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> We're just friends, bro. <laughs> cool. How much surfing do you do? Uh, I mean, not now, because we're in Arizona. Right. <laughs> you get out to Cal. But, you yeah, Cal I'm from California. I'm from okay. Temecula. So, oh, uh, no sweet. Yeah. I was stationed at Pendleton. So oh, Cal okay, sweet. Familiar, yeah. You're in the Marines, Army? Yeah, Marines. Oh, sweet. Yeah, yeah my grandpa. I just shouted him out after my fight. I, oh, was, I awesome. fought in. Um, where is it, Norfolk, Virginia? Yeah. Yep. And my grandpa, he's Maybe. retired. He's in uh, Florida right now. But um, 
my grandma, she was also in the Marines. She was an officer. Oh, wow. My grandpa was a three-star general in the Marines. Wow. Damn. Yeah, super high level. Lieutenant and uh, right after, so my grandma, she passed away when I was an ultimate fighter. But uh, I wasn't able to go to her to her burial, but she got buried in Virginia. So I was able to fight there in my last wow. fight. And then That's after killer. I dedicate my fight to her, and then I dedicated uh, to my grandpa all the Marines. And so there was a bunch of military yeah, there, too. Awesome, it, was, man. it was badass. Was that your feeling, like, when you were fighting? Was there just that much more energy for just a? You I know? mean, yeah, it's, yeah, for know? sure, for sure, yeah. But after, it just felt good to yeah. dedicate like that. and um, That's awesome. Yeah, it's awesome, man. I, the whole thing's amazing. Hey, when you were at the PI, um, what, what did you learn from the performance testing you did up there? Did you notice any like muscle imbalances that you took care of or functional deficits or anything in particular? So I was supposed to go back, but then this whole COVID thing happened mm -hmm. to do my like uh, what allergy test and then like uh, oh, a couple different tests they had, but I didn't do that, but I was just checking it out, doing a couple uh, different therapies and stuff. But mm -hmm. I learned I learned a lot. I felt like every time I seen Heather or I forgot his name, the other guy. A trainer, athletic trainer. Yeah, um, he's really cool. He was, I was just learning so much stuff and I, I literally felt like I was taking a, a college course every time I hung out with them. Mm. And uh, I just want to go back and learn more because the more I learn, the, the better, you know, not just recovery, but it's just, uh, just super good to know, you know, the more knowledge, the more power, so. Mm -hmm. One thing that's really cool that came out of the PI two years ago, I believe, is they published a cross-sectional performance analysis. It was called the a cross-sectional performance analysis and projection of the UFC athlete. And it was about 40 some odd pages long uh, where they explained all the data that they've, they've gotten from all their athletes. Because I like to sometimes put it like this, like you know how Tesla knows where all its cars are and they know where yeah. all the stats are because it's all linked up? With the UFC. Yeah, no. <laughs> Fuck, I don't want to That's talk about I don't want to talk about aliens, bro. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> I didn't know that. Yeah, so they keep really good stats because they can they have data on everything because everything's right. linked. Now with the UFC, we're dealing with one organization instead of a bunch of different teams like say mm -hmm. football or basketball. Right. So that allows them through the PI to gather tons of data on not all their athletes but a huge chunk of them. And they put you out this that. yeah <laughs> they put out this great uh, this great research project where they showed. Um, what types of injuries they people uh, that athlete the MMA athletes are getting and what athletes they're getting in practice and vers uh, with training versus competition and things like that and and I love this 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 uh, this piece of research and I, I look to it a lot and one of the most interesting things in the whole thing is that they found that if one of their athletes had more than 10 percent bilateral asymmetry in a joint or muscle group like let's say one shoulder stronger than the other by just 10% or more, that can increase their risk of injury by 70 to 80%. Yeah. Oh, okay, that's what Heather was telling me. She yeah, said, like, my, right, my right shoulder is a lot bigger than my left, mm -hmm. and I got left uh, injury, mm -hmm. shoulder, rib, clavicle, mm -hmm. neck, all mm -hmm. left side. And now like with a, with, a, with a fighter like you, who moves really well and, and can do a little bit of everything, you'd expect that, like, you probably have the least amount of asymmetry problems than say like a heavyweight who who's not as well rounded because if they have some range of motion or strength deficits one side to another it might not be as noticeable and it might go unseen until of course they get hurt so yeah. that's because one side's trying to compensate is that what it, i'm not so sure i don't think it's it, it would be it could be like it what's the cause is what i'm wondering yeah How? well just because you have one part moving or uh or not as strong as the other part. Yeah, it just leads you to more accidents. I think in general, wow. it could definitely be a compensation thing and mm -hmm. a repetitive stress injury thing, but also just um, you know falling yeah, strange and hurting. She was saying that uh, that plays a part for the weakness, but also for strength of a lot of athletes. Like having that uh, dominant side it plays out to your particular style, and a lot of fighters, some things work for them or their body because of their dominance mm -hmm. you know in, in one type of area of their body well lots of times you find like with certain uh techniques and moves you know you have one good side and one bad side and some we talk about in jujitsu all the time lots of times it's technique or dexterity and things like that but sometimes it's a functional deficit you know like i know for me being 42 years old and 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 doing jujitsu there's some things i just can't do all the time 
Tanquino, my, my teacher, Augusto Mendez, who you okay. train with a bit. Yeah. Um, you know, sometimes the boss. He, yeah. He or uh, another great teacher we have, Reese Hall, will teach a technique at the beginning of class. We warm up and everything. We do some drills. You teach a technique, and I know I'm trying to do it, and I just can't physically do it on one side. I can do it uh, on one side, but not the other. But by the end of class, once we're warmed up and we do a few live rounds and stuff, well, I can do it later. Yeah. And that's where you start to see some of those functional deficits show up, um, and uh, it, it can be super frustrating when you're training. I think so. a lot of it, too, is like is mental and visual. Mm -hmm. When you do one side, a lot of, like, you do the other side, just like seeing yourself doing it and then like mm -hmm. actually doing it physically, of mm -hmm. course, it just makes it a lot easier. Well, you know, lots of times in jujitsu they say you have a good side and a dummy side. You well, know? it's like being ambidextrous, or you're left-handed or you're right-handed, you like doing stuff yep. one way or the other. Yep. So Kyler, uh, what are your goals coming up? I know you're talking a little bit about a fight island. Uh, yeah, so I was trying to fight uh, whenever. I try to fight just ASAP, basically, so. I'm just staying ready for a fight, keep my weight down, training, sparring, and uh, I'm excited. But hopefully, I fight on Fight Island, man, July, let's go. I'm just like, <laughs> this is what I'm bred for, man. I literally, I'm excited. I woke up this morning and I saw that, and I was just like, let's go. Somebody throw me on there, man. Let's go. Mm -hmm. That's like great. Mortal Kombat status. <laughs> All right. Some well, blood sport. Yeah, I'll do some flips after, do some freaking <laughs> katas, and... Fight Look. Shang Tsung. <laughs> Let's go. Be like you Raiden, can, man. Yeah. <laughs> Who's your favorite Mortal Kombat character? Blanca. Or, no, that's not Mortal Kombat. I, Baraka? I, no, Blanca for Street Fighter. Oh, Street yeah, Fighter. Yeah. Okay. Scorpion. Scorpion. Yeah. Oh, get over here. <laughs> get over here. Yeah. All right. Fatality. You'd be like a Johnny Cage. Maybe. We'll see. Uh, <laughs> I didn't play a lot of video games. You didn't, you didn't you know watch Mortal Kombat? Kombat? What's that? You don't remember Mortal Kombat? The movie? I do, barely. What are you I characters? Movie, Dragon Ball Z? Dragon Ball Z? Naruto? Yeah, was never they ripped, <laughs> too, they ripped their old. head out. And there's a spine there hanging. I remember the that. Fatality. It's like yeah. the most brutal. Once yeah. video games went from like th more than three buttons, I was like. <laughs> <laughs> so. What do you like to do other than fighting? A lot. I just This morning, I just got done play, learning a new song on the piano. Uh, I like playing music a lot. And I see a lot of parallels between music and art and everything. Because of like, yeah. like flow? Fighting. Like just kind of Well, both mental. form and flow. So there's like, you can't flow without having form because it's just going to be off. You're trying to flow. It's like, it's like uh, I, I got some couple different like mental things too. When you play the piano, your left hand is like your bass. It's like your footwork. You got to really focus on that. And then your right hand is like your treble. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like your, What about your the pebbles body. on the... Piano. I mean, that could be footwork, too. That's just yeah. the, you know, sustained oh. pedal. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, too, like, when you see, it's like you got to perfect your technique. And, and that's the same thing with the injuries is you really got to be methodical in how you approach these things. And then you'll be free to do whatever you want. Because mm -hmm. if you don't work on the form and your timing and being precise on what keys you're hitting, it's like biting down your mouthpiece and swinging in a fight. Mm -hmm. Imagine doing that in music. And just trying to play, it's just going to sound terrible. Mm -hmm. So, like, I think my style, especially Nikito Kai, martial artist, is about being very precise and being mentally ahead and playing that chess game of, like, let's go, let's play, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? And that's the fun part. That's where it gets fun. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like an art, and uh, I, I love that. There's nothing I'd rather be doing. That's an interesting thing to hear from you because when we think about um, – your fights, you think about a lot of technique and flow and more artistry than you do in, with, some, with some other athletes, especially at, at bigger weight classes and stuff. What do you listen to? What do you listen to like in the hours before a uh, fight? I listen to all types of music from reggae to hip hop to EDM to classical, but I just realized that it, I am the music and I'm making the music. And when I go out there and move, you're literally not just making art and flowing, but you're making music. So mm -hmm. like literally taking all the gifts of life that you've been given, you know, like every single moment is, is a gift. You know, this breath of oxygen I take right now, that's a gift, you know, because I'm going to just take those gifts and be present and have presence and just go forth and just give it back because I'm not going to get this, this moment back. So might as well give it all away and, you know, because that's what I've been given, you know. That's so awesome. I'm grateful for that and grateful to have you guys too. So, yeah. I mean, we didn't get to, I know you, you asked him, I think, about surfing. 
Yeah. So you grew up surfing? I was curious. Uh, my dad was a surfer. Uh, he was actually a pro surfer over in Hawaii, too. Yeah. He, he had an out-of-body experience once. Surfing? Was, while surfing? Yeah. He was oh, in wow. uh, North Shore, Hawaii, and he uh, he got stuck under the, under the reef. <sighs> and this is another thing, too, which as a kid, I was like, you know, what the heck? This is crazy. But he came out of his body, like, instead of trying to drink the water, yeah. he just held his breath. And uh, he came out of the water, and there was a mole in the back of his neck, and he was floating, looking at the mole in the back of his neck the in the water, and he saw a light going, like, going up. And he, he saw a light going up that was pulling him up, and he, it was, he was saying, it's not my time yet. And he was, like, fighting to go back into his body. And then he woke up on the shore. Wow. Yeah, it's crazy, man. man. So, That's like, wild. hearing that story from a kid, I'm just like, okay. That's like intense. If he didn't do that, maybe I wouldn't be here. So right, right. I believe in purpose and, and yeah. passion in what you do. Absolutely. And yeah, I'm excited, man. Well, thanks, Kyler. I think I think we learned a lot today. And um, especially, like, when we watch Kyler fight, he, he seemingly moves different than other people. And what we learned a lot is uh, a little bit about what's going on in his brain when he's doing that. Everything from... Uh, music to the way he flows and the way he does it. So. I'd say like uh, yeah, just like music and art and and styles of anything you see in life. Literally everything is different styles. Nobody and colors on the color spectrum. Like you might like a different color, but none none is right or wrong. It's just what you prefer. And so like if you just go out there and you realize like there's so many different colors you can throw on there and try not to be one style of mindset, not so hard style. You can like literally mix in however you want and that multi-dimensional mindset is just i think that sets you free and be able to do whatever you want so when you're fighting you know? when you're when you know who you're fighting do you bring that to like d different styles of who i'm going up against it this helps is what I'm for sure you, i mean of course you got the ba it all comes off the basis and the basics of everything but if you have something if you have different things of of, of course you have to be aware and on the same level to match their style but adding in some other stuff so they can't see like what the heck is this it's like a question mark it's like they can't because yeah, they, they're doing the same thing to you yeah they can't figure out you know what i mean but like once once you can figure out what somebody's doing then it becomes just a battle like this and then it's whoever's more physical or whoever's more one step ahead and so i think the more of course like this like the more knowledge you have the more power you're going to have in the end all right, it's time to wrap this up. What did we learn today? We learned about muscle imbalances. We learned about protecting your neck. And we learned a lot about Kyler and the way he moves. You can reach Kyler at Kai Matrix on Instagram. And if you need me, you can find me at Dr. Matt Colby on social media or uh, DrMattColby.com. Thanks to our sponsors, Dark Horse Lionheart and 48 Real Estate. See you next time.